Hello, River family. Thank you so much for joining us on this amazingly hot Sunday. So uh, glad you're here. No matter where you are, what part of the world you're, on, you're in, we just consider you a part of our River family. So if you have prayer requests, please let us know. You can send an email to office at theriverabilene.com and we'll make sure that we have people praying for you. But thanks again for joining us. We'll let you know about a few things going on in the life uh, of the congregation. Um, first of all, our, our next Team River class, we're going right through the month of July. So we're skipping July because it's a busy month. Uh, August 4th will be our next Team River class. That's immediately following our regular service, a way to kind of download what the church's vision is, get to know me and my wife a little bit. So if you're interested in that, that's when that is uh, going on. To Mars and Beyond, fun, fun vacation Bible school that'll be coming up July 9th through 11th, uh, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, you can register online at theriveraveline.com. Now, I want to let you know that if you're watching this in real time, tomorrow is the last day to register. So please register today. Get your children in there. Guess what's happening uh, uh, July 17th, 24th, and 31st? Guess it's water. Well, you might say, what is water? Well, water is Wednesdays at the river. And we're just going to get together. There's no child care, nothing like that. It's just going to be family nights to get together, play games, maybe hear a short devotional between 6.30 and 8 o'clock right here at the river. Uh, probably going to provide for the first meal. The rest of them will just be bringing your own uh, supper. But we want you to know that that's going to be going on a great time of fellowship here at the river. We are also praying and praying uh, to get to the place where everyone in this county is being prayed for. So that is happening through the Bless Every Home app. So if you're interested in that, come by, get a sign, put it in your yard, scan the code, get that particular uh, download of Bless Every Home, and you'll be given five neighbors' names and their locations so you can pray for them every day. And the beauty of that is we're praying that God would do a mighty, mighty thing amongst us, maybe a revival, maybe a holy move of God. We really want people praying for the people of Taylor County. Save the date. Huge, huge. Our first ever annual River Men's Retreat. It's going to be at Refuge Ranch, August the 10th. Be somewhere around 8.30 to 3.30. We really want you to sign up for that. Men, please sign up. It's going to be a great time uh, to learn, grow, and be challenged. Also, if you are a part of the river and, and love to serve, which all of us at the river should serve, there is a link online. Uh, it's a call to serve, and it's a way for you to be able to kind of volunteer for places where you feel led to be able to serve. I want to encourage you, go online, uh, figure out a place where you can really serve and make a difference in the body of Christ, which is advancing the kingdom of God. And as always, you can participate in the ministry of Jesus Christ at the river by giving. And you can give three different ways. You can mail a check to 539 U.S. Highway 83, Abilene, Texas, 79602. You can give by secure text at 84321. Or you can give by going to the website, theriverabilene.com, theriverabilene.com. Uh, and you can go to the drop down and be able to securely give there. We'd love for you to be able to be a part of this amazing thing that God is doing here called the River of Life. Uh, a question. Which state has the highest per person debt? And which state has the lowest per person personal debt? Talk amongst yourselves. We'll see you in a little bit.
that's in the blood there's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won so I can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands and all I need you will provide just like you always have I'm fighting a battle
I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. I am working all things for your good. I will withhold no good thing from you. I am your shield and your great reward. I am your light and your salvation. I am the stronghold of your life. I will give you eternal life. I will give you abundant life. I will give you peace. I will give you rest. I will give good gifts to those who ask me, and I will give strength to the weary, power to the weak. I am close to the brokenhearted, and I will comfort those who mourn. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will hear you, forgive you, and heal you. I will be found by those who seek me. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will do whatever you ask in my name. I will listen to you. I will fight for you. I will set you free and I will not change. I will redeem your life from the pit and crown you with love and compassion. I will finish the good work I have begun in you. I will never blot your name out of the book of life. I will come back and take you to be with me. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Logan River family, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're continuing with this sermon series, Seasons Greetings. Moments where the people of God who are following Jesus Christ have uh, clarity in a season, a period of time um, in which God is doing something specifically. The Lord is very uh, discouraged, <laughs> perturbed when we can't see what He's doing in our lives just because we're clouded, we're in rebellion, whatever it could be. He really wants us to know what season we're in. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we could encounter a season of the Savior, a season of jubilee, if you will. Here's an interesting uh, stat. The, the state with the highest per person level of debt is Colorado at north of $154,000 a person. The lowest is West Virginia at $64,000 a person. Guess where Texas is? Right in the middle at $95,531. Imagine if you had a moment where someone could completely erase your debt out of love for you. That's a tremendous thought, isn't it? Could you really believe it? Could you really believe that someone would do something so amazing for you. Do, you. do you see God as the God who does amazing things, uh, unexplainable things, uh, 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 loving the, un the unlovely, healing those who need healing, uh, delivering those who need deliverance? Do you believe in a God who can do things like that? Or is there a certain level of cynicism? Reminds me of this preacher. He's preaching, and at the end of, of his sermon, he says, if any of you out there have special needs, you come on up here. I want to pray for you. And so this man walks up, and he says, I, I really need you to pray for me. He says, how can I pray for you? He said, well, I really need God to, to help me with my hearing. He says, got it. So he tells the congregation, we're going to pray for this guy's hearing. Sticks his fingers up on his ears and starts praying. Everybody in the audience is praying over that guy. They're just praying, praying, praying and pulls his hands off his ears and he said, tell me how your hearing is. He said, well, I don't know. It's next Thursday down at the courthouse. That's kind of the cynicism we have toward an actual healing. We like the humor of it and find it hard to engage in the reality, the possibility of it. Let's talk about the season of Jubilee. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, you are uh, amazing, powerful, overwhelming, unfathomable. You're our Savior, our friend, God of justice, God of healing, God of conviction. So Lord, now I, I pray 
that in the next few moments, you would begin to fashion our hearts into a place of accepting you at your word. Hearing you and conforming. So that a season of the Savior, a season of Jubilee, a year of the Lord's favor would come upon us. And Lord, I pray that I would decrease so that you can increase and be our preacher and teacher. Everybody said amen. Say amen. If you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to go to Isaiah 61. Old Testament Isaiah, toward the beginning of the prophets, the major uh, prophets there. Let me tell you just a little quick context, and then we're going to push over to the New Testament. Uh, what's happening here is uh, uh, this Isaiah is the prophet in the sort of uh, uh, post-exilic time and during part of the exile as well with Babylon. And so uh, this is a very discouraged people, even when they finally are able to, uh, uh, to get away a little bit. They're still super uh, discouraged. The Lord begins to download a, a word of encouragement upon Isaiah. And he begins to speak this word. And it becomes sort of immediately apparent that it's not happening right then, but it is about a, a future anointed one, if you will, a Messiah. So look in verse 1 of Isaiah 61. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me, there's that picture of Messianic picture, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release and release of darkness from darkness for the prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, every Jewish person, I stopped before the end of the next verse, that's quite intentional. Uh, the average Jewish person sees this and understands is the language of the year of Jubilee. You see, every 50 years, the people of Israel have what they call the year of Jubilee, the year of the ram's horn. And, and what happens is, uh, after seven cycles of seven uh, sab sabbaticals, uh, uh, that what, happened, what they mean by that is every seventh year, a field was laid out. So seven of those is 49. The very next year began the season a year of jubilee and in this year of jubilee there would be the blowing of the of the ram's horn on the day of atonement in which they were released from their sins they had atoned for their sins and on this particular day if uh, someone was leasing property from somebody who had to lease their property because uh, they were in debt and and they were trying to avoid poverty that property immediately went back to that person if if, if someone owed somebody debt, that debt went away. If there was uh, someone who was an indentured servant because uh, they had uh, brought up debt or they had made a mistake, they were, were released of their servitude. If somebody was in debtor's prison, they were released from debtor's prison. It was this amazingly jubilant, exciting shock to the system that sort of reset all of society. And so what he's talking about, this is an anticipated, excited moment for these Jewish people that when that ram's horn blows, all the bonds that they have are going to fall and they're going to be free again, free of their lack of responsibility, free of the, the debts that they had brought upon themselves. You see, it's, it's an amazing jubilant year. So every like 49th year, people are beginning to get excited and they can't wait for the year of jubilee. It's going to be so amazing. Property going back to original owners, people being set free from prison, uh, indentured servants walking back home. Just an amazing, amazing moment in a year. He's using that language. So they get this jubilant picture that there's going to be an, a, a crazy moment, this year of the Lord's favor when the blind are going to see, the brokenhearted are going to be bound, the, the, the people are going to be set free. It's going to be this amazing, amazing uh, moment that's coming. But they knew in time and space it was not happening. And they were 
quite clear that that person that was going to eventually be anointed to do that was not necessarily Isaiah. It was someone to come. They saw it as, as prophetic and messianic. They knew that in the horrors of what they were dealing with, the difficulties of life, that there was coming an amazing day in which the Lord's favor be the year of the Lord's favor. Now, fast forward to um, Luke chapter 4, and we're also fast forwarding in time about 700, 750 years. And Jesus has been uh, baptized. He has uh, been in the wilderness, uh, the desolate places, tempted by Satan. He's come out of that victoriously. People, he's beginning to teach in synagogues. People are beginning to know who he is. And he goes back home and he creates a stir. Luke chapter 4, look in verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Now that is language from his temptation. He's coming back in the power of the Spirit. He's compelled. God is, is with him. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him like, this guy's amazing. He went to Nazareth. He went back to his hometown where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, that would be our Saturday, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. You know, there's a lot of people in Christendom that want the, um, let's call it the institutional church to just go away because it's just not of God. When Jesus went to, to synagogue every day, I mean, frequently, every week anyway, it was part of his regular diet of spiritual disciplines. Where he went and he was brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, which is what they normally do. You stand up to read in uh, reverence and, and um, respect for the Word of God. And the scroll of the prophet, he, he read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found a place where it was written. Now watch this. Um, <clears throat> What happens, he's beginning to get a little bit of fame. So the synagogue leader and his assistant, who's called the chassan, the assistant is the person who sets everything up, kind of protects the building and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, maybe an executive pastor by today's standards. And, and he's running all the stuff. And Jesus has been invited to actually be the speaker. The way they would run these, these synagogue uh, worship services is uh, they'd start off, everybody would, would, would recite the Shema. There would be an opening prayer. They would read uh, from the law. It would be a prescribed moment of the law. It, later on, they go through the law, the entire law, every three years. Uh, after that, there would be a, a reading of one of the prophets. And then someone would speak. And they would uh, explain and create application in relation to either what was read in the prophet or in the law. And then there would be a, a blessing by the priest or a blessing, uh, a prayer, a blessing by a lay person. It was kind of this regular service. That's how they would do it. It looks very familiar uh, to those of us who are Christian. Jesus is getting a little bit of fame, so he's been invited to talk at his home church. And he reads this passage from Isaiah. See if it sounds familiar. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Does that not sound exactly like Isaiah 61? Just a little snippet from 58. Isn't that crazy? So 750 years before, they're saying this is a prophetic moment. The anointed one is going to fulfill this. And he and his home church is standing up reading the text. And watch what he does. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave back to the attendant, the chassan, and he sat down. Very stereotypical, the teacher would sit back down. Everybody else would remain standing while he spoke. So 
He sits down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. They're really, there's a lot of suspicion. They know who this guy is. They're really fastened on him. Now watch what happens. He be, began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Fulfilled. Plero. It means to make replete, overflowing, to cram, satisfy, uh, uh, to execute and to finish, to complete, to make full. The embodiment of the year of the Lord's favor was in Jesus. He said, I am the fulfiller of this passage of Scripture. (laughs) Mic drop. He is saying that the new, the new Jubilee, the supernatural spiritual Jubilee is now here. People who are blind spiritually as well as physically are going to be able to see. Um, those who are poor in spirit are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to know the good news. Um, Those who are bound up in addiction or through demonic influences are going to be set free. Um, There's going to be those who are oppressed by people or other forces are going to be set free. God's favor is going to be upon You, and it is fulfilled right here in me. The beginning of the Messianic age has just now begun. Boom. Mic drop. Can you imagine what happened in relation to that? Can you imagine that this man is saying, I am the fulfillment of the Messianic age where all of these cool things are going to happen. Beloved, let's be honest. I think every one of us want that age. I think every one of us want that moment when God is supernaturally setting people free and doing healings and, and, and that there are moments when the good news is being preached. People are coming to Him. We, we would love to see that. I... Uh, was privileged to hear a 19-year-old student um, that was a freshman at Asbury begin to unpack and tell a little bit about that Asbury revival that happened last year. Amazing, amazing. She went to class, started getting text. They had gone to chapel. She went to class. She's getting text. She needed to come back to chapel. Something's happening. 10 or 15 students had stayed afterward. Nothing exceptional, nothing crazy in chapel. They were just repenting. God was doing something in their home. The Spirit of God was moving. The year of the Lord's favor had begun in their lives. And these students are crying out to God. And then it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. And they have to shut the whole town down. And people were released from addictions. People were healed. People were uh, delivered of demonic influences. Uh, People came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. It was a moment of the Lord's favor. Every sincere, God-fearing Christian would love to see that. Love to see that. But the people of Nazareth don't get to. Let's find out why. So he rolls up the scroll. He says, it's fulfilled in my midst. And then he says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Now listen, it's very subtle. Isn't this Joseph's son? They, they, they start the process of distancing themselves, of pushing back from the year of the Lord's favor, from the great jubilee, the, the, the season of the Savior. They begin to push themselves back Suddenly, by going, man, he is, that was amazing. Isn't that Joe's boy? Literally. Isn't that Joe's boy? And in one moment, a a sliver, a subtle sliver of doubt 
in the possibility that this guy named Jesus, Yeshua, that he might be the Messiah and be ringing in a text from 750 years prior. And they bring heaven's capabilities down to a human limitation by saying the words, isn't that Joe's boy? They take someone who pre-existed in heaven with supernatural powers embodied in flesh and they limit him to human limitations with a subtle statement of, ain't that Joy's boy? Man, that was great, but isn't that, isn't that Joe's boy? You see, the people of Nazareth are not going to encounter this. The people of Samaria encountered it. They embraced him. The people of his hometown will not encounter it because they've already slid in that little sliver, that little subtle moment of, of doubt. Isn't that Joe's boy? He talked real good, but isn't that Joe's boy? A sliver of doubt can transform things. It reminds me of this lawyer. He's <clears throat> defending a client. Um, he's on trial for murder. His client is, but there is no, no body. And so um, throughout the course, he realizes he's losing the case. So he knows if I can just put a sliver of doubt in the minds of these jurors, then, then they'll have, it'll be a hung jury or they're going to have to acquit him. There's just no way. If I can just get that sliver of doubt, that's the power of sliver of doubt. And so he's talking to him and then all of a sudden he comes up with this brilliant idea in his closing arguments. And he's saying, listen, you, you have no proof. There's no body. And I'm going to guarantee you right now in one minute, the person you say my client is killed is going to walk through that door. And all of a sudden the courtroom falls silent and they all are staring at that door. Slivered out. A minute later, he says, I just lied about that to prove to you that there's doubt in this case. Well, the jury goes back and they deliberate, come back after just a little bit. And they find the man guilty. And the lawyer afterward begins to talk to me. How in the world? Could I, I established a sliver of doubt that should have transformed this whole case. Everybody in the courtroom. The juror said, well, everybody. We all looked at that door. We were all waiting for that person to walk through, except for your client. You see, doubt can transform an entire picture. And yet, a lack of doubt can open up new doors. The people of Nazareth were like, wow, that was amazing, but ain't that Joe's boy? And so they're taking heavenly capability and they're degrading it to human limitation by him just being old Joe the carpenter's boy. It begins to subvert a moment, a season of the Savior, a year of jubilee, that amazing year of favor of the Lord. It begins to push it away. Now they go a little further. I'm going to read through this quickly. There's so much I can unpack here, but they go a little further. Look in verse 23. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and I'll tell you, do here in your hometown what you have heard that you did in Capernaum. He is basically, um, uh, just to encapsulate that, he's, he's saying, you're going to tell me to do stuff because you don't really believe. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. That's kind of an older prophetic uh, phrase and understanding. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land yet, land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow of Zarephath 
in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah, in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Now he's beginning to say, you're like all the widows that wouldn't embrace. You're like all the lepers that wouldn't embrace what God is doing. He is, back to my original point about seasons, he is saying you are dull to the season of the Savior. You are dull to the year of Jubilee. You are dull to the year of the Lord's favor. You're not even seeing it. They know exactly what he's saying. And what's their sweet reaction? All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through them, right through the crowd, and he went on his way. Their reaction was violent. Their reaction was one of of a, a personal cut. You see, we all want to embrace that season of the Savior, the year of Jubilee, the the year of the Lord's favor. That season, we all want to see that. Every one of us want to see that. But it is going to be subverted if we allow a sliver of doubt. Like if, if we can't believe in His heavenly capabilities, we want to put it into some sort of human limitation. And the second thing that helps subvert this and keep that season of the Savior coming is whenever we take conviction that can move to repentance and transformation, when we take that and we react in personal offense, then it will subvert what God is doing in our lives, what God is doing in our church, what God is doing in our world. You see, they heard truth. You're like these people who are missing it. Jesus said it. That cut him to the quick. That was convicting. The Spirit of God was on him in power and it cut him to the quick. And their natural reaction, instead of going, wow, we don't want to miss it. Jesus, what do we need to do? Instead of, let me at least consider this. Instead of crying out to God, they became personally offended because that is the best way to save face in light of conviction. When the Holy Spirit is convicting us, people around us will excuse us from that conviction if we can show offense. They're mad. They're trying to throw him off the hill. They're trying to throw him uh, off the hill where he'll probably hit the ground, damage just enough so they can finish him off by stoning. They're He read a text. He said a sentence. They want to kill him. That seems like overkill. No pun intended. It's amazing that instead of embracing the truth and the conviction of God Almighty in their hearts, they take it as personal offense so that they can go after him. Beloved, we live in in a culture where I would say The new God of self-justification, the new God is personal offense. And when God moves, there's either transformation, revival, repentance. That happens or there is offense and violence. You see, we live currently in this culture where one of our new main gods is offense. And when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us, the best way to save faith, face is to be offended instead of repentant. They should have said, oh, we don't want to be like those people. We get it. You're saying that they missed it. We don't want to be like that. Jesus, help us. Instead, they were angry and they subverted the year of Jubilee. They subverted the year of the Lord's favor. They supported, uh, subverted the season of the Savior. Tell me that in crazy. Let's let's talk about how.
how it happens in our lives. You know what the number one reason is? That people leave a church to the 66%, 66% of people leave church for this main reason. They were offended. Now I'm going to venture a guess that they didn't have an understanding of the fact that the church is filled with people who mess up. That's part of it. But I'm going to venture a guess that through interaction, through the Word of God spoken, the Spirit of God moving during worship, that in those moments, the best way to save face from the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their lives was to become offended and run from repentance and transformation. Do you, do you want to see the year of the Lord's favor? Do you want to see a, a season of the Savior? Do you want to see the blind see uh, um, those who are, are caught up in, 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 in addictions, those who are in debt, those who are far away from the Lord and their sins need to be forgiven, uh, the, those healings? Do you want to see that? I do. But more than that, I want it to start with a simple invitation to Jesus. They gave him the text. A simple invitation, Lord, you speak to me. And when those words convict me, I will repent so that the season will not be subverted. What's God saying to you right now? Are you subverting a divine moment, a season of the Savior, the year of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor? Have you been able to insulate yourself by being offended? Have you been able to denigrate the power of God by imposing human limitations on heavenly capabilities. What's he saying to you? Invite him to speak and then be ready to repent. Be ready to embrace the season. And then be ready to see a move of God like you've never seen before. Are you ready for the season of the Savior? Will you avoid subverting it? Nazareth does not experience. They don't experience the season. Capernaum does. Even, um, you know, these people that are not even fully Jews do. Gentiles do. But his hometown misses the season of the Savior. Beloved, what's he saying? Will you embrace it? Let's pray. Lord, um, I pray that there would be uh, a new... Uh, move in our hearts that allow us to truly embrace when you say you're bringing a season. When you say that there is a season of the Savior, a year of Jubilee when people are going to be set free and healed, come to know you, what we would call revival, Lord. I pray that we would be the kind of people that when you speak, we don't impose human limitations on what you say can happen. And that, Lord, when you are convicting us of where we are, convicting us of our dullness, I pray that we would embrace the conviction to be transformed as opposed to taking offense and becoming angry. So that there will be a season of the Savior, a year of of Jubilee, a year of the Lord's favor 
the messianic age. In Jesus' name, amen. What's he saying? What's he saying? We'll see you next week.